my good friend, welcome. Grace to you and peace. We're gathered to uh, talk together about a lesson from Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 23. This is the appointed lectionary text for the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. And it is the lesson that we would have shared had we been allowed to gather in our congregations on July 12th, 2020. As it is, in this medium, we have the opportunity to share it whenever is convenient for you, and I am grateful for this opportunity indeed. So we'll begin. We'll be reading the lesson from the New Revised Standard Version, as is our custom here, and then we will see where God takes us together. So Matthew 13, starting at verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Then the disciples came and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven but to them it has not been given. For to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, you will indeed listen, but never understand. You will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing. And they have shut their eyes, so that they might not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn. And I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root and endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arise on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So if we were going to summarize these 23 verses, this rather long lesson, I think a fair summary would be, Jesus tells a story, then there is a really weird and off-putting section about why Jesus tells stories. And then Jesus explains the story. So let's go through it in that order. Let's receive it as God's word for us. And let's endeavor together to open ourselves to whatever God wants to teach us today. So first, the story. Jesus says, listen. Listen. Fair enough. A sower goes out to sow. And the sower sows seed on four different kinds of soils with four different results. Some seed falls on the path and the birds come and eat it up. Other seed falls on rocky ground 
They don't, there's not much soil, the seeds sprout quickly, but when the heat comes, they wither away. Some seeds fall among the thorns. They grow up, but the thorns choke them out, and other seeds fall on good soil, and they yield magnificently. In Jesus' day, a yield of 10% was considered very good. They yield a hundredfold, or 60-fold, or 30-fold, and then Jesus repeats the instruction, let anyone with ears listen. Huh? Well, it seems clear that Jesus expects people to listen, that he wants us to struggle. He wants us to wrestle with this story. He wants us to try to figure out what it means. There's not an awful lot here for us to grab onto. It's sort of a tame story. It's sort of pedestrian. We have birds and seeds and soil and thorns and rocks and then yields. Doesn't seem like the sort of story that would get anyone in trouble. Doesn't seem like the sort of story that would excite a crowd. And then it gets really weird, right? Because the disciples, they say to Jesus later that night, why are you talking to them in parables? Why aren't you just teaching them things? And Jesus says, it's a paraphrase, but you look below, you look in your Bibles, you read, you see how close I'm getting. You guys get to know stuff. They don't. That's the way the world is, you know. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Those who have get more. Those who don't have, even what they have, gets taken away. I'm doing this on purpose. And before you have some sort of heart attack at the great unfairness of it all, let's pause and breathe and think together about this thing that Jesus says, his explanation for why he tells parables instead of being more direct. First, I think it would do us some good, some credit, if we acknowledge that Jesus has his reasons and he knows more than we do. Members of the church are quite aware of this by now, but we have a book in our house. It's a book of manners, and I love it. I have uh, accosted my children with it uh, for well over a decade now, and my favorite page in the whole book is, you can argue with people who know more than you do, but it's stupid. It's a wonderful rule for life. And Jesus knows more than I do, and he clearly has a plan. He's clearly working a plan, and it's probably a good moment for me to just tip my hat and keep quiet. But of course, you and I aren't going to do that. Why would Jesus set things up so that some people get to understand and others don't? It is so manifestly unfair. Is it? He explains absolutely everything to his disciples that very night. And presumably, if anyone had followed him home from this seaside storytelling time, he would have explained it to them too. And you, you're absolutely on the inside. You know stuff that the disciples didn't know that they couldn't know. You know the, the direction of this whole story. You know who Jesus really is. You know what Jesus has come to do and how Jesus will do it. How exactly are you offended by this? And let's continue to be clear that the Gospel of Matthew was written maybe 65, maybe 70 AD. Since that time, absolutely anyone who wanted to know what this story meant could hear the story, could read the story, could read Jesus' explanation. It doesn't behoove us to be offended here. There's something going on. And if we could pause in our offense-taking for a moment, perhaps we can figure out what it is. Why would Jesus, the Lord of life, why would he be telling stories so that some could hear and that some 
would not, so that some could understand and others could not. What's going on? Remember, Jesus doesn't say, I speak in parables to leave people out. He invokes a prophecy. And for the really slow in our midst, for the really, really lazy, he even tells us where we should go to look it up, to think it through. He says, this is what the prophet Isaiah was talking about when he said, and he gives us several verses from Isaiah 6. You should open your Bible to Isaiah 6. You should pause this video and you should read Isaiah 6. It's written below this video. It's reproduced so that you can look at it there if you don't know where your Bible is. And why don't you know where your Bible is? Please. So Isaiah 6 is the calling of Isaiah. And I'm going to read that to you so that you and I can try to figure out together what Jesus is up to. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty. The hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say this to the people. Keep listening but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the minds of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. And then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate until the Lord sends everyone far away and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remained in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains standing when it was felled. The holy seed is its stump. Do you understand the call of Isaiah? That Isaiah is sent out with a message that people will not understand, will not hear, will not heed. And not understanding, not hearing, not heeding, they will experience profound judgment. Their land will be taken from them. Their cities will be burned. They will be carted away and many will be killed down below a tenth remaining in place. But the ones that are left, the stump, the burned remains are a seed from which new life will spring. Remember that Jesus is a shoot from the stump of Jesse, David's father, one of Jesus' names in the scriptures, that this idea that judgment 
will precede a great healing, a great reconciliation, is written throughout all of the pages of the scriptures. The disciples say to Jesus, why are you telling parables? And Jesus takes them back to this parable in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah is commanded to preach an uncomprehended message until the judgment is complete. And then the healing will start. The salvation will commence. The reconciliation will begin. You and I are expected to know these things. When Jesus invokes a prophecy, we're supposed to go and look it up and figure out what he's talking about. Jesus is talking the way he talks because judgment must precede redemption. That's not what God needs. It's what we need. We insist on it. It's not God's deal. It's something we demand. We aren't interested in redemption until we are desperately sure that we need it. We're not interested in grace as long as we're convinced that we're doing okay. And just you and me, right here, we really do think we're doing okay. We really do think that we're the good ones. And that it's nice that God pours out grace and forgiveness on some of the really messed up people, but that's not us, right? We insist on judgment before we'll listen, before we realize that God's talking about us. We need to be convicted before it occurs to us that we need mercy. The law kills, the gospel saves. There's a reason that the catechism is set up the way it is. Those of you who've been following along know where I'm going with this. That we start with the Ten Commandments. And in thinking deeply about the Ten Commandments, it becomes clear to us almost instantly that we have broken and continue to break each and every one. Desperately, we break them. Habitually, we break them. Regularly, predictably, we can't stop. We can't help ourselves. We are wrecking balls in the vineyard of the Lord, destroying everything that we're supposed to keep and keeping everything which ought be destroyed. So in the Catechism, we have the commandments. We're brought low, we're humbled, we're humiliated. And then we get the Creed, where we learn about the glory and the grace of God. And then we're led into the Lord's Prayer, where we, from our position of agony and brokenness, call out to God to save us, to redeem us, to lift us up, to make us whole. We insist that judgment comes before redemption. During the uh, Napoleonic Wars, Lord Admiral Nelson was the commander of the British fleets, and he defeated the French Navy. And the defeated admiral brought his flagship alongside of Nelson's ship uh, in order to make his surrender. And he approached Nelson smiling, his sword swinging at his hip, and he held out his hand as one would meet and equal. Nelson made no move, made no response. He just said quietly, your sword first, sir. Laying down one's sword was a visible sign of surrender. So Jesus tells his parables to bring us low, that he might then lift us up. He tells parables to make us lay down our swords, that he might then take our hands. And this parable about bird and soil and seed and thorn and yield is about the great mystery of faith and unbelief. This shows up in our families, right? That you'll have children in the same family, raised by the same parents with the same rules. One will believe, one will not. Why? 
children will grow up, one of them will attend church regularly, participate and believe. The other will not. Why? Two friends and neighbors who agree about nearly everything will find themselves divided on this point. One believes. One thinks it's sheerest nonsense. Why? Jesus today would have us consider that God is at work and that God is working a plan. And it's a slow plan. It's an inefficient plan. It's a merciful plan. If God were just to wrap things up today, an awful lot of us would be in trouble today. We're counting on God to be merciful and patient with us, and so God is working this plan. There's no overwhelming of anyone. There's no compulsion of anyone. There's just this steady, extravagant sowing. Some people won't get it. Other people will start and then they'll stop. Others will start and then other interests will seem more compelling, more interesting, more immediate, and they'll follow those interests for a while. But some of us, in some of us it'll take root. Some of the seed will grow. Some of it will be fruitful. And a harvest will be brought in so that the gentle, patient sowing can continue next year and the year after that and the year after that until the last day of the last year. You've been caught up in this work. Your life has been claimed by God that you might be fruitful and that through you more seed might be produced might be scattered, that more would be brought home, that more would be saved. Would you still argue that God is being unfair? You who've been brought near, you whose life has purpose and meaning within God's redemptive plan, you who have a place in the reconciliation of all things, in you, God is creating a harvest worthy of great celebration. In you, God's grace is being made forever known. The sower continues to sow in love and in patience and in mercy. And you are his. May the Lord bless, protect, and keep you in faith. In Jesus' name, amen.